Peter Serta, world Bitcoin expert that you are. It's really great to have you here. The pleasure is all mine. Um, we are speaking now at a time when uh, the Bitcoin dollar exchange, uh, do you follow Bitcoin dollar or you follow Bitcoin uh, euro closely? Dollar because it's the more liquid market, so yeah, I have uh, because it's more liquid. So 93. Uh, I, I have one, two here, 90. Something, 94. <laughs> we, should, we should trade some Bitcoin like this, Peter. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, um, are you concerned? Well, you know, it, it can go up and down. I, I think that we can uh, expect uh, high fluctuations until it reaches much level high of liquidity so I wouldn't worry about it too much it can go up or down if it goes if it goes down say it goes down to fifty dollars over the next week which could happen right uh, yeah sure then 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 we'll, we'll get all the uh, press saying CC it was it's unstable it's too uh, infl it's too uh, speculative. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, the a similar situation actually already happened around June. May June 2011, it grew from like uh, one or two uh, dollars per Bitcoin to like 30 within five weeks, and then it dropped and uh, was dro kept dropping for another five months. And uh, in the media, they always say ah, it's a, it was a bubble and it's the end and so on. But uh, that was one and a half years ago, and now it's back up. But uh, the thing is. Uh, I, what I always like to say is that the price is irrelevant. That, that, that's a bit of exaggeration, but the point is that the variable you should be looking at is liquidity and not uh, not uh, price. I'm actually doing uh, liquidity calculations. I did uh, some of them for my thesis. I'm continuing to do that now. And here, uh, while I haven't seen an improvement uh, in the relative, when I see the when I view it from the point of view of relative uh, um, relative slope, it's more or less the same all the time, which means that if uh, it's not significant or inherently less stable than it was before. What what about and of um, course there are there, there are plenty of other things happening like the Cyprus things, all the new businesses being announced and so right. on. So that's that's different. Yeah, and how much of the new run-up is actually due to this uh, instability in Europe? The conventional wisdom now is that that um, that is the main driving force behind the current price, but you don't see evidence of that? Yeah, well, it's really difficult to say. In the, One of the conclusions I made in my thesis is that there is a strong correlation between uh, uh, what I call visibility, that's uh, the, the search how often people search for for Bitcoin in uh, in uh, Google search and the price. And while I haven't reevaluated that metric now, I have a uh, what is it called a Google alert that it notifies me if there are uh, news articles or something about Bitcoin every day. And uh, when it was uh, kind of slowing down, I got like one or two per day, and now I get like ten per day. So there's a media hubbub happening, but which direction the influence goes, that's uh, at least I, I, in my research I haven't resolved that there are other researches, one of them claims that uh, that whatever is happening in the uh, in the media, like the and that's influencing the price. Would you follow volume, trade volume? Uh, I don't follow that metric, no. And what about what about um, uh, velocity? I mean, is there any way to measure that? Yeah, uh, I, I have a, uh, a suggestion based on the, uh, the accumulated uh, uh, Bitcoin that is destroyed, but uh, I haven't recalculated that since November because uh, it depends on the production rate of Bitcoins and uh, that halved in November. And uh, in order to, to continue calculating it correctly, I would need to update the, the algorithm to cater for this change in production rate. And so far, I have been too lazy to do that. So yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't know the, the result, unfortunately. 
Do you see evidence that the rate of Bitcoin creation is gradually slowing? Well, the of course we know from because we see the data that it have the uh, in, in at the end of November. This is actually a funny thing because uh, uh, Bitcoin kind of seems to have created uh, uh, a following and uh, li li like a, a counterculture and with with its own. Uh, uh, myths and uh, and uh, ceremonies like when there was a having when the having occurred there were having Bitcoin having parties all over the world so uh, it's actually funny that uh, when uh, when the when you have QE like uh, an increase in the production then it's the bankers that celebrate and when the Bitcoin rate halves it's the little guys that celebrate. Yeah. Now, am I right that half of all the bitcoins that will ever be created have already been created? Yeah, that, that was what happened in. The, That's what you mean by half. November. Yeah. I see. Okay, so that was news to me. I only found that out actually just a few minutes ago. As a fact, uh, Peter, I have to tell you something that I've been thinking. Like a lot of people, you think about this topic a lot, you know, uh, for a long time, but. Only in researching an article for uh, the Freeman that's coming out on Monday did I happen upon what for me was the critical turning point in understanding Bitcoin. And it relates to uh, the, the limits on the double usage, the, the, the uh, built-in constraints within the software itself to radically scarcify Bitcoin, not just in its overall number of coins that can be mined, but in a, a very strict association between uh, a Bitcoin and the, uh, I guess, the public or the private address, I don't know which one it is, the public key or the private key, uh, of the particular coin in question. In other words, the assignment of property titles that impressed me the most, uh, that's a point I didn't entirely understand before. And it it's very relevant from the point of view of monetary theory. Yeah, yeah. Basically, it's uh, the how it's implemented technically. That's very interesting, but very complicated. But for uh, like to, to explain this to a normal guy, basically, it creates a system where you can have a scarce resource and simultaneously grant only the, the virtual titles. Yeah, as you said that. Only one specific person who has control over the key can also control the balance. And this is, uh, well, it was known that this is technically possible probably, but this is the first time that someone implemented it in a way that it works. This is the thing, actually. There have been attempts to make something similar. People have been speculated how it could work and uh, what the future would be, but they, they never got off very far for whatever reasons, but Bitcoin is the first thing that actually works. This is this is the amazing thing that the, the practical thing, the, the workability that precedes our theory and understanding of all these things. Every day I, I've been spending a lot of time on research on Bitcoin for the last about two years and almost every day I realize something very deep, some new quality that I hadn't realized before and I see how how amazingly uh, innovative this is yeah so but uh, yes um, as I understand it there was one currency that actually achieved this uh, problem of um, uh, property titles before and that was e-gold but the problem with e-gold is that it was centrally controlled yeah Whereas this is peer-to-peer -peer yeah. controlled. Was this that? was one of the innovations that Bitcoin produced that yeah. to, to, to allow this, uh, this scarcity to work without central control. Right. So, Peter, just to, just to review this uh, for my own purposes here, um, I think this actually is what accounts for um, a natural kind of skepticism that people have towards Bitcoin. Because when we think of digital media or the Internet or code, the, the critical feature of this type of commodity is its 
reproducibility. That's it. And so it's the infinite scalability of digital media. I mean, the fact that I can have a picture on my computer, I send it to you and I don't send you what I have, rather I send you a copy of it, but it's exactly the same. Yeah. And computer code has this infinite scalability, this reproducibility, and I've written so much about this. And, the, that the, yeah, the, yeah. I've, and I've argued that this is why, you know, digital economics is so, is so wonderful and holds out, everything is a non-scarce good. And I think that for me personally, this is probably what was in the back of my mind bugging me about Bitcoin. I'm sorry, I, I lost you for a second. Uh, Can you uh, what I mean is that uh, maybe for me in the back of my mind, this was what was bugging me about Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I only just uh, discovered that just how secure this relationship is between the coin and its owner. Uh, in, uh, or a, an owner. Yeah. Uh, so the point is that this ledger is constant is publicly distributed and it's constantly being updated it's impossible for more than one person to be the owner of the same coin at the same time yeah yeah uh, this is uh, i i agree with you that uh, this uh, uh, this feature is difficult for people to understand without being heavily involved in in understanding how it works in the detail but maybe I can provide an example that's easy to understand. There's a, uh, there's a limited number of characters in the English language. There are 26 characters. Yeah. Now, while it is easy to copy them, from the, there can't really be more than 26. You would need to, to change the whole language. You can't invent a new character. So... This is not a full analogy, but at least it makes uh, it makes it clear that there are possible ways to to create uh, scarcity on the protocol level. Merely because you can copy something, that you can still view it as the same thing rather than a copy. This is a uh, yeah. Now it gets a bit difficult to understand, but the the my. Just 26 characters language can't be changed for right. can't be changed without everybody agreeing to it. Right. Yeah. Well, I think it's interesting. I mean, uh, another way to look at it is that it just works exactly like the gold standard. Um, except, uh, Peter, here's the, the critical thing. Um, the gold standard had a huge disadvantage in that... Uh, uh, you can't carry around all the gold you own. And in fact, it's, you've got security problems if you try to store it in your home. So we have to use uh, warehouse functions, right? Yeah. But because gold, like Bitcoin, is uh, fungible, uh, this greatly tempts um, banking institutions to uh, grant more title ownership than can be supported in its underlying deposits. As I, as I understand the way Bitcoin works, in the first place, there's no necessary physical reason for a warehousing function at all. But even if it did exist, uh, it's impossible to create new property titles for the same property. Yeah. This, uh, this is uh, something very interesting. And... Uh you are right, you actually put it very well, that there's no need for the function that historically was deposit banking if you're using Bitcoin as money. Now, whether, with, how this will work out in the long run, this is an empirical issue, so we can't 100% be sure that it won't happen similarly or not. But at least we can now grasp that there is no necessity that this happens with Bitcoin. With gold, obviously, as long as you want to use it over the internet or use it in a paper form or just you, you don't want to store all your gold in, in your house, this would be simply a natural evolution. Now, let, let's avoid the issue whether that's a, a legal problem, but from economic point of view, you would expect some uh, uh, fractional reserve banking and... Uh, the expansion of credit to evolve with a gold standard. But with Bitcoin, 
even if there is no there are no legal restrictions even if uh, if we think that this is actually beneficial from economic point of view like the the free banking branch of the austrian school for example it's still there is still the the most likely uh, the, what most likely would happen is that something that there's no credit expansion basically well it's physically impossible with bitcoin well the, the it, it, you can create uh, more than uh, 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 too many claims on bitcoin huh. but the thing is will these be treated as equivalent to bitcoin i see most likely they won't we can't be sure right but i think that most likely they won't so so peter uh and i hope we're not just completely talking over people's heads here but but let's just explore this uh, one step further so uh every bitcoin has an owner and there's no getting around that that's it if you re if uh, if you borrow my bitcoin then basically <coughs> we have to decide are you the owner or am i the owner that's it and you can maybe establish contracts uh, so that l later, under certain conditions, you could be paid uh, in greater Bitcoin later as a kind of an investment vehicle. But but that that contract um, itself is not it's not money. It's maybe it may or may not work as a money substitute, right? Yes, exactly. That's my point. Right. Because um, with 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 gold, if you create a credit instrument, it might hype. Uh, like uh, if you loan somebody money and uh, create an IOU, we are we can't be sure that someone will accept it as a medium of exchange and it, it will start circulating. Right. But with Bitcoin, it's unlikely that something like this would happen because uh, th there's no need to to decrease transaction costs over the, right. the gold coins. But Peter, let's let's say that they're developed a secondary market for uh, Bitcoin Bitcoin bonds or. Or loan yeah. obligations. Okay, let's just say that this is true, and they 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 circulate in financial markets like mortgage-backed securities, for example. Yeah. Uh, my 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 point is that even if this market becomes gigantic, it's still a purely financial, speculative market that doesn't have, as far as I understand, any effect on the underlying supply of real money. Uh, I, I spent a lot of time dealing with this topic, and I uh, I think it gets a bit fuzzy, but uh, uh, most likely I lean towards your your interpretation that there will be highly liquid markets and financial instruments, but they won't be perceived as money, which means that we won't have the the problems that the Austrians described but credit expansion like the. Uh, the the business cycle and right. so on. But the point is that even if they are perceived as money or they're not perceived as money, however they're perceived cannot physically change the relationship between Bitcoin and uh, the title to Bitcoin that really exists. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, I mean, so, one of the problems with um, fiat money is that it discredits things like, uh, you know, credit markets. I mean, like, it's hard to tell what's speculation and what's uh, property titles, you know, in the modern monetary yeah, yeah, economy. Yeah, I haven't thought about this, but uh, I would say you're right, yeah. Yeah. So with Bitcoin, there's absolutely no confusion. <laughs> and what's funny about this is that, as we know from the research of Huerta de Soto, Jesus Huerta de Soto, that this confusion between a, a loan and a, a bailment, right, came about because of a court decisions in the late Middle Ages or in the Renaissance period or whatever. But no court decision, no court decision can ever change the code structure of the Bitcoin. Yeah. So that's the, that, because the, the, this is also. Uh, I think that most people, they don't even distinguish between the monetary base and the money substitutes from in their own personal lives. But whether this is due to legal uh, proceedings or not, I don't think that 
very important. I think that even if there was a court proceeding to the contrary in the Bitcoin world, that still doesn't automatically mean that people will jump to, will, uh, will stop perceiving this disconnect between the, the Bitcoin itself and the credit denominated in Bitcoin. Right, but uh, the ledger they, is... Their phones won't accept it. If, you, if I send you bitcoins on your, on your phone, right. you will accept bitcoins. If I send you a credit instrument, you won't see anything. Right, that's right. I mean, you, I, either I am the owner or you are the owner, and this is yeah. constantly kept up in the ledger, and if, yeah. and, and if the, anything ever should go wrong in the ledger, what happens then? Well, uh, this is... Uh, the, the ledger is actually covered with a very smart idea. If something goes wrong with the ledger, then you will have a fork, which means that there will be kind of two ledgers existing in parallel, or more than two ledgers. A fork, F-O-R-K. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, there could be communications problems, there could be technical difficulties, there was one about three weeks ago. And this creates a bit of unclarity of who owns what, but in the worst case, there are two options. Either both of those will survive and people will kind of, there will be two different Bitcoin types, or one of them will simply die out. So this is a, this is a funny thing. This kind of, uh, in many cases, is automatically resolves all these issues. If there are problems, you suddenly have either two choices or one of the choices will, will automatically vanish. I was online when this fork happened three weeks ago and yeah. watched it in real time. And I think the dollar Bitcoin uh, price was 48. Then the fork emerged. Maybe it fell as low as thirty-two. Yeah. And the course of an hour. Twenty-five percent. Yeah. And then at the end of the hour, when the uh, when it was discovered what uh, the problem was, uh, and there was a resolution uh, between the fork seven and fork eight, I guess it was. Yeah. Uh, I think all the the new bitcoins and eight were thrown out or something. I don't remember what happened. Yeah. But uh, then the price immediately bounced back up again. Yeah, uh, I actually am writing on a blog post where I uh, have some recommendations about how to use this feature of Bitcoin from the perspective of anti-fragility that uh, uh, Taleb and Trico uh, yeah. developed. Uh, and uh, I, I have some recommendations about how to, how to combine those two approaches so that uh, Bitcoin can become anti-fragile. If there are problems like this, it will in the end become stronger rather than yeah. uh, it will just try to stay the same. Well, and I think, you know, it's, uh, part of the, it, it's important to remember, isn't it, that we're still in the very early stages here. Yeah. So, uh, and in fact, I think within, am I right, that within the first 18 months of Bitcoin's existence, we're talking about something invented, basically, it was first went online November 1st, something like that, in 2008. Right. So within well, the, 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 the there were some the, there was in two thousand eight, and there was uh, there were some debates, but the actual Bitcoin as we know it was launched on January third, two thousand nine. Okay. Okay. And uh, yeah, at the beginning there was almost nothing happening. Yeah. Right. Right. But it worked. Just nobody was, or almost nobody was using, and it has been working until now. And it was fourteen cents in the, over the course of the first two years. But but early on, there was a, a an error in the code that was discovered that allowed uh, double spending, that was repaired, and something like the spring or summer of two thousand nine. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I uh, if I think about the same thing as you, there was some technical problem that. Uh, it was a technical glitch, basically, and uh, that uh, if the, the glitch would have continued, it would have prevented Bitcoin from working correctly. So they had to fix the code and then create a new fork back at the back to the time where it broke, 
and then wait until the new one overtook the old one. Do you... So it's not. This is not the first time that it happened three weeks ago. Yeah. But uh, it, it actually shows a very interesting thing because if it if it didn't fork, then it would just die, and that would be the end. So this is a, this is a way of uh, kind of compensating against uncertainty. In the United States, we have a, a big movement calling for the Federal Reserve to be audited. Do you know about this? Yes. Yeah, I, I follow Ron Paul from time to right. time. Right. Yeah. So uh, there is be, be no reason for uh, audit Bitcoin movement because it's audited every single transaction. Yeah, it's public. The, the information that you would need to audit it's publicly available. Anyone one can verify it. And uh, in fact, there are tens of thousands of computers verifying this all the time, all over the world. And what about uh, a board of governors? Oh, yeah. Uh, this is uh, perhaps a bit difficult to understand, but maybe if I make an analogy of language. There is no one in charge of the English language. But there are like specialists, maybe linguists, linguists who do some research. There are dictionaries being published and so on. And these like provide hints to people what's the proper thing. Often even you have uh, different types of cultures that develop their own slangs and so on. So it's similar with Bitcoin except here the adherence to, the, to one standard needs to be a bit more strict. And... Uh, but th there is no no one who, who can make these kind of decisions because everybody needs to... If there is a decision to be made, everybody has to make this decision. Right. You can go for with people, with a guy A, you can go with guy B. But no one can tell you, okay, now you've been following me now, now you continue to follow. Right. And, and, and the... Uh the uh, how would you say the Bitcoin community, the developer community, right? Yeah. Uh, they are not doing like the Federal Reserve is doing and deciding how many Bitcoins to create. This is something that is decentralized, also. Well, uh, it's the, the the amount that's being produced that's still following the the same rules that were set up by the by Satoshi Nakamoto who developed this, and they haven't been changed. And based on my a personal impression whenever there is a suggestion by whomever to change this thing there's a lot of criticism and uh, people are calling it theft for example and so on so i don't think i don't think it's likely that anybody would accept a change like this unless there were some some real pro technical problems like it was about to die or something but as a, from the point of view of economic analysis, analysis, I don't think there is a reason to change anything. So I would say that uh, we don't have a reason to, to change this. And many people tend to do it this way. And even if there was a change like this, most likely you would again have a fork. You would have two different types of bitcoins. The one that is inflated more and then the one that is inflated less. And Unfair. everybody can then make a choice which to use. At the beginning, we might we might see, for example, that uh, those two types of bitcoins would start trading at a different price. There would be an there would would be an exchange ratio, and one of them, probably the more inflating one, might also die very quickly. Right. So, what happens when Bitcoin reaches ten thousand dollars? <laughs> what happens? Well, you will see a lot of uh, a lot of media attention, even more. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, how do you That's spend? A, Are there going to be new names have to be invented for ever smaller fractions? Oh, yeah. uh, this has been uh, debated. There are many proposals of what to do, but uh, uh, I. I I can't say because it depends on how people perceive it. There could be, for example, a change that uh, uh, people will start using milli bitcoins. That's like one thousandth of a bitcoin, or uh, th there could be sim simply different names. Like you have uh, uh, in 
I, I don't know how much uh, this is indoors, but you have names like Nickel and uh, Penny and so on. And so, so it's the same thing could happen with Bitcoin. And 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 it could be, uh, let's say, one Bitcoin is a million dollars. It doesn't matter, right? It just doesn't matter, because every quantity of Bitcoin. There are twenty. There are going to be twenty-one uh, million Bitcoins in existence, but and that that will not be able to be increased at all. But uh, any any supply is good for. Uh, all existing exchanges, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, uh, have you read Rothbard's Mystery of Banking? Uh, it's possible. I don't remember. Uh, I think I did, but I, I'm not sure. Well, I, I do. Uh, if I did, then I uh, I have uh, I have highlights from it recorded. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just asked because it seems like uh, Bitcoin is set as it almost serves as, as a kind of a blueprint for how Bitcoin is working. I mean, that's my sense of it. But okay, I, I might I might want to reread that. Uh, yeah, I mean it's very interesting. Well, have we covered everything enough for this interview? I uh, uh, this this situation in Europe, uh, uh, I suppose it can only get worse. And it seems like many people are looking to Bitcoin as the one safe haven left. Well, we don't know that for sure. There have been claims in media that this is happening, but I have yet to see a, an actual hard evidence of this happening. You know, right. because as a proper scientist, I need to be very, very skeptical right. and and so on. Well, so it's possible that it's happening, but. I didn't really have much time to do research in the last two weeks, yeah, yeah. so maybe there is data, yeah. But uh, we need to be cautious. Yeah. About this. Well, a lot of claims in the in the media, but uh, you know how it is. You watch the business news too, right? The reporters always seem to know exactly why the stock market went up and why it went down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, Peter, thanks so much. I hope this can be the first of of many calls. So it's good to keep it somewhat short, although not too short, um, because I hope we can do updates in the future. Sure, I'd be glad to. Thank you so much. Thank you as well.